Supreme on the track. Talent and hard work is not enough. You need someone who knows the system and how to play the game. Hello, everybody. This is Supreme Decisions, and welcome to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Today's, I guess, lesson is going to be a little different in the sense of the way it's going to be grouped together and how it's going to be done because I had a little snack food this morning. My main computer, my desktop, my baby went out on me, so I have to go to Apple you know, probably either later today or tomorrow to get my baby fixed and we can go from there. However, I do have a responsibility, not only to you guys, but also to Spotify, iHeartRadio, and a few others. But even in the responsibility of that, I have to go into something. Because more often than not, people come to me and they want to help me with my federal court case. Help me with the direction I need when I'm dealing with certain aspects of police encounters and even the legal, I guess, the legal venture that you're going to embark on. Well, today I'm going to talk about unreasonable searches in the context of when you're being searched, generally property-wise, but even in the process of being searched, And understanding the connection and the collective suing. I guess that's what I have to do. Suing using 42 U.S.C. 1983. Because a lot of times, many of us miss the thing that's necessary. And in this, I'm going to be reading from a case. Colbert B. City of Chicago, 19, uh, excuse me. 2017 and it was in the seventh circuit the reason why i'm using that is because this case while the precedents it set are real subtle many people in chicago have gone through this more often than not because even you know they were actually my favorite well second favorite um police department to take shots at especially with eddie t johnson at the helm Because they were constantly serving warrants on the wrong house or putting people out and not even having the right person when they do go to the wrong house. And they would cause damage. And even with the context of the body camera footage comes into play. I tell people about the responsibilities they have and I'm actually going to reaffirm that even in this episode so the basis of the episode is going to be the conspiracy of silence claim and it's going to be a claim for plaintiffs who are prevented from witnessing the search now because police sometimes cause significant damage while executing a search because you even see it on TV, they, they're searching the car and all of a sudden they're ripping open headrests or they're tearing up the dashboard and then they're telling you, okay, we didn't find anything, go on about your way. There's even a young lady who, um, who here in Texas had her garage door completely ripped off for whatever reason, but she could not name the police officer who did it. The problem with this is she has one exterior camera and the place of that one exterior camera was out of view of the garage which to me is asinine I have a spot because even if you came to the studio the studio not only had a outside camera it generally had a doorbell camera and also another camera that was facing out the window which covered the front door. So that's three cameras just coming into the front door of the studio. Not to mention several videos from several other cameras with several other angles inside the studio. 
And even in today's climate, we understand that we need to be vigilant, not only for our own safety, but to actually make sure that those that are supposed to be protecting us is doing just that, offering their protection, not violating us, because we know they're not turning those videos over. But this is if the damage is unreasonable, the property owner may bring forth a claim against the individual officers under USC 42-1983. And that's going to be provided as a cause of action for those whose constitutional rights have been violated by a person acting in a governmental capacity. Here's the catch, because this is the police defense. Remember that, because not only do I give you the things that go on, I also must give you both sides in the context of knowing is half the battle. So understanding what you're going up against so you can better prepare for that actual encounter. If the owner cannot identify which officers caused the damage, the claim will fail. And one of the things about the Chicago police, what they would do is they would remove all subjects from the site of the search. There was often one I think I did where the police officers um, executed the search early in the morning where everybody was actually asleep and then they were taken outside in the cold in their pajamas and pretty much bedwear or underclothes. And they were left out there for at least an hour and a half. There was damage that was done to the property, but again, they prohibited the owner from witnessing the search. So therefore, their defense was the owner couldn't identify which officer caused the damage. Now, there are, there are means in which you can, in fact, sue. Even in these contexts, even in these situations. However, there are other aspects in which you need to do in order to make sure your claim is effective. Because this is a fact scenario. And it requires individual responsibility if you're going to be suing under USC 42 1983 remember that facts only we don't need a 40 page affidavit giving your interpretation of what happened only the facts remember the video who what when where why how that's all that needs to be written whenever you're placing these things into a complaint and it has to be done individually now we also understand other aspects of lumping people in those come later but in the aspects of this for this for the 1983 the fact scenario and the individual responsibility requirement are set in place United States v Ramirez 523 U.S. 65 1983 excessive or unnecessary destruction of property in the course of a search may violate the fourth amendment and even though the entry itself is lawful because remember we're talking about them executing a search warrant the search warrant has to go through specific places or things to be searched now a lot of times well, because we don't challenge them often, the search itself is vague. They'll just have an address, but they don't tell you what they're looking for or who they're looking for. Or they'll tell you who they're looking for, but they're not telling you where specifically. And these are the things that can be attacked. However, that's part of the what. The who would be the one that's leading the charge for the search. Just like I've, I did a um, podcast about Sergeant Inman. In Richmond County she would be one of the who's her obstruction from allowing the homeowner to actually close the door is the what the date and then the why because she says she did not have a search warrant and she was not given permission and there was a video that showed these violations and then you set forth what remedy you're looking why because now there's a Supreme Court precedent that is clearly establishing 
that she cannot, Officer Inman, cannot place her foot in someone's door to obstruct them closing it when she does not have a lawful reason to be there. Because Officer Inman stated she did not have a warrant. So, these are things that you will place that on. And Wolf Lily v. Sonquist, and it's a Seventh Circuit decision from 1983. An individual cannot be held liable in a 1983 action unless he caused or participated in an alleged, alleged constitutional deprivation. Now, let me, let me kind of iron that out because I kind of stumbled through that. An individual cannot be held liable in a 1983 action unless, remember that, if and or, he caused or participated in an alleged constitutional deprivation. Understanding the, const, uh, the construction of that. When Officer Inman forced her way into a home which she did not have consent to be in, did not have a lawful reason to be there, the other officers that came into the property, they can then be charged with 1983 because they all willfully violated a constitutional right of being private in one's home because she did not, Officer Inman stated, she did not have a warrant to be in the property. Those officers were lumped in because on video, they all forced their way in. They participated. But again, the one that will be doing the complaining will be the homeowner who witnessed it. She's able to point out each and every officer that came in. So she would not have the liberty of the conspiracy of silence unless, which I'm going to get into, the officers couldn't uh, cover their identity, which I have another video that will be going up, hopefully, actually, hopefully if I can save it um, on my computer, I can get it out to you guys. Because at the end of the day, when you're looking at these videos and you're understanding it, you have to now get an overstanding of the context in which they're being um, presented to you. But when you're in the, in the context of the, peop the family from Cal uh, Chicago in which they were taken outside, they can't point to the individual officers who committed damage because the front door is generally sealed and they are not taking down curtains. So there's no means of physicality except if you have interior cameras. If you have something set up that will see for you when you are not available for seeing them. Because police officers can have a legitimate reason for detaining someone while conducting a search, such as presenting, preventing flight or minimizing risk of harm to the officers. And that's Michigan v. Summers, 452 U.S. 692, 1981. This detention may prevent someone from witnessing the search, therefore requiring officers to permit owners to witness a search may not be a feasible solution. But you remember, even in that detention, because they're speaking on this, in the context of a Terry v. Ohio search. They must show that there is an ongoing threat to the officers. They must show that there is a means that the person being detained is going to take flight. The officers must prove that. They must show that they have a reasonable belief of this. And generally what they would do, is I'm going to go into this, is habitual evidence. So if it's someone that is a quote-unquote that they've had experiences for with and that person has ran in the past, they're generally going to use that method or use that as an excuse. Because again, they're going to use you against you and not even value the context. Understand that. They're going to use you against you and not go in depth about the context of may 
be the reason your first flight took place. Now, the officers alleged heavily damaged to the apartment. Now, this is also one that can be used for the young lady here in Texas. Because they pulled out insulation, they punched holes in the wall, they ripped the couch open and damaged kitchen countertops and shelves. Such as, again, here in Texas, the young lady had her garage door torn open. She had some sheetrock that was torn up. And there were holes that were poked in certain parts of her home that was done by the officers. The difference is, she did not have a camera and she was outside during the search. She could not point out the individual officer who had done that. Because when you're using this, this is where the Jiglio information comes in. Because if they were there for the search warrant, you can actually challenge that search warrant. Because there was criminal damages act. There was damage to your property. And you can actually use past search histories of those officers that were in your home. Because the officers violate the Fourth Amendment right by causing unreasonable damage to the property. When you're talking about this, you're understanding all of these things that I speak about. I might speak about them in, you know, minute situations. But understand, all of these are tie-ins. Because Willingham wrote that Crutcher knew that a firearm was in the resident and it violated his parole. They used that as a construct of habitual evidence. So they used that to justify a search that was illegal. And what they're also using is the constructive possession doctrine to violate this young man's parole. I'm going to get into that because that, to me, is important. It's understanding the constructive um, possession. Understanding how they get from one place to the next. Understanding how the stock language goes whenever they're doing these things. But it's also understanding that this is why when you're doing discovery, you're requesting Brady or Jiglio information. And because that officer, if he's lied in the search warrant, that um, lie goes to not only his character, but you can also search for it in the stock language of the police report. That's why so often whenever we're looking at officers being accused of something, 90% of the time when we get the video, it doesn't match the police report. And that's a high number. Now, that's also an exaggeration. I don't have a real number for that. But how often are we privy to video from the body cameras of police officers, which generally, if we do get it, it's years later, and it doesn't match the police report, i.e., my favorite, um, my favorite police department to go after is Arizona. Phoenix Police Department said they encountered... A young lady who had stolen from a family dollar. Now, context. It was a two-year-old girl, stole a baby doll, unbeknownst to her parents, from a dollar, a uh, family dollar. They said in their report that the family hopped out of their truck aggressively. The video that we got showed that the officers Yell to them prior to them even getting out. If you move, I'm going to blow your effing head off. While being searched and arrested, this young lady's father had bruises on his face. In the police report, it said he struggled with the officer, causing the officer to use necessary force to subdue him. The video showed the officer tripped him while he was handcuffed and pushed his head against the bumper of a truck. Do we call those lies? Do we excuse that behavior? Because again, those officers are still on the street because no one is challenging any arrest that these officers are made, making even when it is known that they are liars because they have lied on sworn documents that have been used to charge people. 
I'm going to say that one more time. These officers are known liars. No one, meaning us, are, is challenging them based on jiggly information. And these officers are still working and they are using their lies to charge others. Why is that? When we know these are bad officers. Because these officers have lied on sworn testimony. But here's the thing. I'm even using the Seventh Circuit whenever I'm talking about this because this will happen because Chicago federal complaints will use the Seventh Circuit decisions. Understand that? Chicago federal complaints will use Seventh Circuit decisions. These are the things that you need to be cognizant of when you're putting together. Because here's the thing, and I keep saying you, and I'm throwing it back on you, and I'm because even if you're using an attorney, and I constantly tell you piranha don't eat piranha, the reason we're not fighting back and we're not asking for it is because we're not requiring our employees to do their job. Say that one more time. We're not requiring our employees to do their job. Because even if you're using an attorney, that attorney should be doing a detailed discovery requesting specifically jiggly information on each officer involved. The easy is the first one that is on the complaint or on your citation. Then when you do a scene report, everyone there gets it. And remember, because even if you're in Georgia, if you don't request it, you cannot bring it up if you are convicted. You can't bring it up on appeal. You can't bring up the actions of other officers. You can't even bring up conspiracy possibilities. Now, do you understand why I tell you to get these things? Because it's your responsibility to take care of you. Because personal responsibilities require that you have the ability to identify each officer that is causing any damage. This is the means of cameras covering your property. And if you are in a conveyance, you're driving, you need dash cameras in your conveyance. You need to protect yourself because you know police do not turn over their body camera footage. But it still needs to be requested. Because even when you're understanding this context, when you know that these officers cannot participate in the conspiracy or of silence to conceal their identities because they're on your video, because your video was either live, because your video was placed somewhere else, because your video is more, more readily available than theirs. If there is a conspiracy, if there is an attempt to cover up, they now have to answer for what is seen, which is also one of the reasons why I tell people to go back. Hey, find somewhere where there are other cameras. Ask those people for their camera and be specific of the time that you're looking for. Time, place are, are not, you know, this is actually not a Marvel movie. They are relative, not substantive. But you have to understand when and how to use it. Because you have to weaponize our need for attention now. We have to weaponize the need for somebody to go viral. Everybody need You may look at it as an intrusion. And in fact, it is. It's, it's a pain in the ass. Because I even hate doing videos. I really do. I hate doing live shows. I hate doing all these things. However, comma. You need to prepare yourself. To protect yourself. And in the context of doing this. You need to understand simple. The simplicity of. Making sure you are protected. Because there are cameras. Everywhere you're going. And everywhere you are at. Because. Those that are signing up. To protect you. Aren't doing it. And you have a responsibility to you. Now, to succeed on a malicious prosecution claim against police officers, the plaintiff must show that after the arrest, the officers 
committed some improper act that contributed to the prosecution. How do you do that? Well, you start out with the police report because that's what the prosecutor is using to prosecute you. But you also do that with the request of this detailed discovery. Because remember this, because the improper act, including alleged false information in the arrest report, is a malicious prosecution by the police officer. I'm going to say that an improper act, allegedly false information on the arrest report. That is malicious prosecution by the police officer. To succeed on a malicious prosecution claim against a minute, uh, to pro goodness, let me t let me take a little sip of water. Let's take a sip of this. I had no yak today. I got me some alkaline water. Got my little glass. So let me take a little sippy sip. Oh, that's actually pretty good there. To succeed on a malicious prosecution claim against a municipality, a plaintiff must show that a custom or policy violated his constitutional right. Now, this is the part where, for me, it gets fun. Because what you, un well, hell, what most people don't understand is the cherry picking of the prosecution. Because one of the greatest questions asked, ever asked, and was probably one of my best podcasts, because I bring it up so often, is the Tommy Sotomayor question. Now, don't care how you feel about the man or his views or his life, but understand the substantiveness of the conversation that he, of the question he asked. Right? Go listen to that podcast. But in the context of this, when you're requesting discovery, a prosecutor has a certain amount of time because even in federal cases, it says, as soon as possible, even if not requested, they've got 10 days. Because again, they're cherry picking a case. 90% of the cases begin because a police officer said something. That's why if you don't challenge what the police officer is saying, the judge takes what the police officer is saying as the gospel. They take it as fact unless you're challenging it. Because you have the right to be presumed innocent, but you also have the ability and must act as if you are. You must defend yourself as if you are innocent. That's why everyone has the right to counsel. Now, understanding this, when you're challenging that policy... One of the things that the prosecutor does is they'll, oh, I, we, we, we weren't sure that we got it. That's why you have the right of sanctions. That's why you have this motion to compel. That's why you have these secondary things that put pressure on the prosecutor. Because, again, the prosecutor is the one cherry-picking your case. They're cherry-picking the fight. So now the responsibility, because they even have responsibilities, even if the police do not turn over the information you're requesting, prosecutor still has to do that, has to do something, because they're making a conscious decision to prosecute. And if they're choosing not to do that, it is a malicious prosecution. Even if it's one of those, because my favorite one lately has been, it's illegal to give you discovery actually have that and I'm going to in my um because again uh, the new series is damn sure coming but it's a it's a prosecutor here a defense attorney here in El Paso that literally wrote an email to her client and said I can't give you discovery because it's illegal and it was her case that the 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 defense attorney was telling her she couldn't see, yet Texas Code says she needs to be available, made available for discovery, to examine it, to inspect. 
But for her to examine the inspector, that's illegal. But she didn't give her a code when she asked for it. And then she threatened threatened the the defendant by saying, if you're going to do this to the prosecutor, I'm going to get off the case. Honestly, I actually would have let her get off. But that's one of the things that not only do they tell you as a defense attorney, but they also tell the prosecutor tells that same lie. Because the only reason someone should be shielded from discovery or points of discovery, because again, it's not going to be all of discovery. It's going to be points of discovery. It's going to be possibly information that not used for prosecution. But if you're using a police report, you're saying that that officer is telling the truth. You're now saying that I can put that officer's character on trial. Officers in Texas, not all of them, most of them wear body cameras. I don't think the troopers do, but I think most of the people here, most of the police officers here do. I can request that body camera footage. Because you have to convict me beyond... A reasonable doubt. And I love the fact that they'll tell me, oh, well, a traffic ticket is not not something that you can get discovery on. Well, that makes an, an administrative procedure, which means it falls under civil actions because in civil cases, you can get discovery because there's a code for that. Remember I talked about the organic code of your state? That's also the rules and procedures for how you're going to be interacting in a legal aspect in your state. They can say what it is. Police officers are even allowed to lie to you. So if they're getting paid or incentivized to lie to you, why would you think they're not lying to you? Yes, I paused for dramatic effect because I wanted you to think on that one. But even in the context of this, I want you to understand something. Even with the surface stuff I give you, all of the things that I've given you, all the 400 videos or whatever over the years, I've given you bits and pieces that allow you to be effective. Now, you may not know how to put it together properly, but you know that there's a possibility of a fight. You understand that there's a reason for celebration. There's even a reason to go in with confidence. Because even in the context of this, not only have I given you the things that you'll need to fight, but I've also given you the things that are going to be used against you in your fight by the opposition. Because knowing is half the battle. Because you can now be prepared for it. Because even when I talked about this, because even if you listen to my little Swell podcast, one of the first things I talked about was expectation management. Because understanding what you should and should not or could not expect are things that allow you to be more effective in doing this. Now, let me take one more sip and then we're going to move on because this water is absolutely delicious. The court also reasoned that even if allowed burden shifting, you would have had to sue all officers present because the burden shift is similar to Ressa Issa Locatia, which in Illinois requires a plaintiff to join all possible injurers. Now, I'm going I'm to step back a little bit. The Seventh Circuit reasoned that an officer satisfies the personal responsibility requirement of 1983 if he or she acts or fails to act with a deliberate or reckless disregard to the plaintiff's constitutional rights. Here's, here's where I 
I kind of differ in a sense. Because this to me is where when I speak of a bad cop is a good cop's worst nightmare. Because if you sue one, you have to sue them all. Did you catch that? When you sue one, you have to sue them all. Because you have to sue the ones causing the damage. And then you have to sue the ones that did not intervene. That's why I speak about the separation. But here's, here's what goes deeper into that separation. Alright, because I'm going to bring this up one more time for the end. What makes that cop good just because they didn't do it? Or is it because they continue to allow it to happen? Yeah, we're in the thinking portion of this. Because you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And when someone is exhibiting excessive force, they're part of the problem because they were standing by and therefore failed to intervene. So how can they be good? Because I love when someone says, oh, it's a small problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a small percentage. It, it's not very many cops. It should not be any cops. But the simple fact that you're willing to allow it because it's a small number. I want you to understand that because, again, the context of the 300. Most people never understood the massive amount of damage 300 soldiers did. Just, just understand that. They took 300, a very small number. Because I actually watched the, I watched the show yesterday with um, Dr. Richie. Um, and indisputable. And there was a young man on there from, I believe it was The Walking Dead. And he was talking about, well, he, I would like police officers to be able to do their job and not be feared, you know, not um, be afraid of being sued. One question that Dr. Richie didn't ask, but he did pop some good ones, but what did he believe that a police officer's job was? Because everyone wants police officers to be able to do their job, but we want them to be able to do it without violating someone's rights. But the one thing that Dr. Richie did counter with, which was phenomenal, was the fact that if they're doing their job the right way, they won't be sued. A complaint means nothing if there's no proof or substance to it. So even in this context, I can't be good if I'm participating in bad. Because if someone, if I take my homeboy to a bank, he robs that bank unbeknownst to me. I am now part of that bank robbery. So why is it now we ask for forgiveness for these police officers that are part of these searches, part of these excessive forces, part of these constitutional violations, even unbeknownst, to not have any responsibility when we'll place responsibility on anyone else? Don't worry about it. I'll let you think about that one. Because plaintiffs unable to individually identify officers who violate constitutional rights should allege that officers were engaged in a conspiracy of silence. Now, the need to identify an additional deprivation of rights protected by federal law is required. Oftentimes, we are not able to identify all officers, which is one of the reasons why I tell people, hey, get a copy of the scene report. Because if they're there, they have to say they were there. There has to be a record of them there. They have to give their side of what happened while they were there. But if you're not able to identify everyone, and you cannot pull an additional deprivation of rights under federal law, 
you are probably going to lose your case. But one of the things that you can actually add as a rider to your cause of action will be a right to access the courts. Now, there must be an actual conspiracy actionable under 1983, and the court has announced principles regarding group liability of police officers. So, a lot of times when we're talking about this, what did I say earlier when we were talking about group? You have to assert those that were there, they either were acting with, or they were ignoring and allowed it to happen. Because you remember I even talked about suing the state. I talked about suing supervisors. But this is where the 1983 kicks in for that. Now, these are not common. Always understand, these are not common. Because explaining that police cover-ups can give rise to an action, a cause of action based on deprivation of rights, to access the court to litigate the underlying misconduct. How do we do that? It begins with the police report. It begins with the detailed discovery. This is one, literally, that's the first video. If you join a master class, that is the first video that I have. A detailed discovery. In a couple of days, I'm actually going to delete it and redo it because the foundational principle of the detailed discovery is beyond reproach. Because that itself, the detailed discovery itself, is one that it sets up not only your actual case at the time, it sets up any future cases. Any appeals, any lawsuits, any of these things that grow from that. This is the root. That first encounter is the root. That's the foundation. So you need to have a sturdy foundation if you plan on doing anything else beyond that. But it's a way to continue laying the base for that foundation, which is one of the ways that you can point out and pull out conspiracies because we can't keep saying, oh, they're hiding stuff in the blue wall. They're hiding stuff in the blue wall. And then we're complaining to the blue wall about the blue wall and then being upset about the actions that are coming from the blue wall. Or, let me put it this way because I'm going to talk about a police officer. You're complaining to a cop about a cop and then getting upset about the cop not doing anything to the other cop. Yeah, I'm going to let that ride too because we saw it recently where the news reporter was at the bank. In Phoenix, you know, gotta, gotta love Arizona. Arizona, make sure you stay on your toes because they make sure they continue to violate so you know where you need to start demonstrating that. Anyway, they told the reporter that the reporter, they had reports of other stuff and they arrested him and then they wrote in their police reports he was doing this and he was doing that and then we got a cop, then the news got a copy of the police report and then videos started showing up that weren't from the police. And recorded phone calls started showing up that weren't from the police. The police said, oh, they found no wrongdoing. He, he, everything they did was above board. Then come to find out, the person that they had said this to, she had recorded the video, had a second video. And she gave it to the news. And the news put it out. So now the police report, there's lies in the police report. Then when they talked about, oh, well, yeah, we, we filed a complaint with uh, internal affairs. Police officer calls, not only the news, and says, hey, the case has been closed. Well, not the news, but he called the um, young man who had been arrested. The case has been closed. Didn't know the young man that recorded the, the conversation. The young lady who was there, same police officer calls that case has been closed. The news calls after putting up these calls, and they're talking, oh no, that case has never been closed. We're still investigating. Wait, hold on. A month ago, it was closed. 
It wasn't said once. It wasn't said. It was said multiple times that the case was closed. There was no wrongdoing found until it went on the news, and they showed. Because here's here's the thing. I, I, I'm I laid out a foundation, but I want I want you to understand something. Oftentimes, people come to me, and I tell them this is chess, not checkers. I'm starting a series, you know, the principles of chess. And one of the things that I constantly tell people about is about timing. It's understanding strategy is about timing. Now, the news report started the day that the man was arrested. They put they actually put out the little bit of stuff that he had, and then they waited two months, sixty days. They waited till they got information, not only from the police, but from the witnesses there. And they made sure that when they put it together, they had a timeline. So now they made sure that timeline was irrefutable. So now they put everything out. And they put the police and the uh, Arizona police department on blast for the most part on notice now they have to retract the things that they were saying they have to retract the things that they were doing they have to now answer for those things and this is prior to the lawsuit they did that because they have an audience they're not seeking money damages they're seeking attention they're seeking more eyes on that because one of their own was snatched up. But you have to understand, they didn't just jump out there. And if you look, even look at most of the people that deal with Ben Crump, Ben Crump doesn't help anybody that's not popular. He also understands timing. He also understands his value being part of a case, even if he is just a face. There are a lot of people that call him. There are a lot of people that want help because what kills me is people like, oh, it's only, oh, what would the guy say from um, The Walking Dead? Oh, it's only 10 to 15 people that have, you know, that are shot unarmed every year. I was like, wow, that's, that's a horrible low number. That, I, we've had more than 15 to this point, which is March 21st, 2023. We've already had more than 15. But what, what gets me is when we're going through these, is to see the blindness that most people have and not understanding and not under, you know what, not valuing the context or foresight that I'm giving you. Because I'm aiming you in a direction. Because I'm giving you something in order for you to win. If you want something instant, you want something fast, this is not for you. Everything you do when it comes to law has a process and a procedure. The rarity, the rarity of quick is... It's like winning the lottery twice. It's happened. It's definitely not common. Like there's somebody that's won Powerball twice. Not that's not that's like catching Haley's comment. I'm probably not gonna be around for the second one. I saw it in elementary school. I'm not probably not gonna see it again. But you understanding it's so rare. Because even if you look at most cases that are now getting traction, it's two years. Why? Because all the state stuff has expired. There have been adjustments that have been made since, since the incident. When you look at settlements, we're actually still settling four years later cases from 19, uh, 2017. Just, just, just let that sink in. 
We have cases from 2017 just now coming to settlement agreements. But it's the wherewithal to continue the fight and understand that there is a process and a move for every action that's going out. So, with that being said, when I'm giving you these tools and these jewels, I want you to understand there's a reason behind it because whenever I'm giving you something, it's for you to win because I don't wake up to lose. I don't get up to lose. I don't speak to lose. I don't talk losing. I am... My son asked me a question one day, and I thought it was amazing because he still has that 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 kid like resilience and mindset. And he asked me, he said, he said, Dad, you're mean all the time. And I said, Really? You see me as mean? He said, Yeah, you're mean all the time. He said, But everybody just they just do nice stuff for you. He said <laughs> And he said, you have nice things. And he goes, why? And I told him, I said, the one thing I love is I've always been built different. So when you're built different, you're blessed different. And I told him, that's why you don't look like your brothers and sisters. You're not built like them. You haven't gone, you've gone through more than they have. You see the world from a different lining than they do. You're built different. You act different. You live different. I said, so understand, you're going to be blessed different. So when you're calling and contacting me for something, understand, there's going to be a different blessing on your movement. But you have to be willing to continue to go through your movement. Because as long as you're willing to go, I'm willing to help. Because the second you stop, so do I. Always understand that. I'm going to fight with you, not for you. I'm going to guide your expectations. I am not going to give you anything that you should not have to win. And that is one of the things that go in with this. Because just wanting to do something and wanting it right now, right now, right now, that is not what this is. Because even at certain cases, you can't even throw money at this. But you can bring them to a point of, you know what, let me, let's, let's stop this before something happens. But see, that's where I'm actually doing a reconstruction of my brand. Because I want you to understand, I'm going to weaponize the information. I'm going to weaponize, because if they're not going to selectively take these cops off the street... We're going to make them worthless. We're going to use them to force their hand to make sure we have good cops and not just a few bad ones. We're going to make sure we have good cops, make sure they're doing proper policing. But it begins with us fighting back. And it's us fighting back knowing what's needed to fight back properly and win because nobody cares about someone's fighting that's not winning you can hit a bully in the mouth he might come back but if you beat a bully down you no longer have a foe now officers concluded or conspired to conceal identities to their responsible for the damage to their Okay, let me, let me slow down a little bit. The officers colluded or conspired to conceal their identities for their responsibility for the damages. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, that alkaline water is serious. So if you, you want to alkaline, get your body right, eat your greens, and get you some alkaline water. That's my public service announcement. Anyway, I'll give you a story real quick, and it was actually kind of funny to me. Now, when we talk about this, one of the things I was doing was I was suing police officers, suing district attorneys, and I, I was suing. Now, most people don't care about somebody that's filing a bunch of frivolous lawsuits. The problem was I was winning. 
That was the problem. I was winning the lawsuits I was filing. And over a two-year period, I was, I hate to say I was guns blazing, <laughs> but I had nothing else to do but put, apply pressure. Just apply pressure. I was applying so much pressure to what wasn't even funny. Like that. My, I had a calendar for pressure. And so when I, got, when I, you know, I actually um, helped my nephew in his murder case. And that actually ended up getting dismissed. I then, I think a couple days later, I got arrested at my grandmother's house. And the beautiful part was I asked, I asked one of the police officers, like, like you know, how long were y'all looking? He said, well, we know that you don't care about a whole lot of stuff. But we do know if you come into town, the one place you're going is to your grandmother's house. You know, for, we know for fact, we don't care about nobody. You might not go see your mom, but you're going to see your grandma. So, so we just sat on grandma's house. Right, that made sense. So now I get taken to 401. Um, for those that don't know, it's 401 Walton Way, one of the worst condition um, jails I've ever been in. Um... So I was there maybe 14, 15 hours. I wasn't there long because I didn't even, I don't even remember dressing out. I, I really don't. But so I get transferred and these two officers come in. One officer has tape over his name. The other officer doesn't have a name badge at all. So I'm, <laughs> I'm shackled, you know, got my feet, got my hands cuffed or whatever. So I go and get into the van. There are no numbers on the van, which was, again, odd because it's a transport, it's a, it's a prisoner transport van. So I can't use the van number, get GPS location. I can't do any of that stuff. And then I can't see the plates. So I noted that I did not see the officers. So what was hilarious about the whole situation was, again, because I was suing police officers. I know I noticed that they did not have their name badges on, and the one that did had tape over his. So I asked, I said, "Well, since you know you still have your name badge on, what's your name?" He rips it off. He just completely just ripped it off, and it was funny because he actually tore his uniform, and they turned the radio up. So the other prisoners on there had noticed it immediately. And everybody turns around and looks at me. And they're like, who in the hell are you? And I just sat there and I laughed because to me it was comical. So even, you now fast forward, I've been arrested. I've been arraigned 72 days in jail. Um, I get bond. Grandma again comes to get me. I do a request for those transport officers. Not only did they scribble their badge numbers and their release and all that, they actually did not have proper transportation or transfer papers. Because even on that, everything but the officer's name was typed. The officer's name was just scribbled in. And I cracked up laughing because I couldn't identify those officers, so I could not sue them. This is not only a tactic that they use in searches. This is a tactic that is used to conceal their identities. Because I can't say, well, they didn't, they didn't write their name on it because their names were on it. I just couldn't read it because it was so illegible. But, again, the semantics of it. The names were on there. The badge numbers were on there. It was just so illegible. It's, it's shame on you. Because they had proper orders. But I said that to say this. That is one of the things that can be used in a conspiracy. My thought pattern at that time was, do I really want them? Because by this point, I had been going out with an Uzi so much, just anybody that I saw could get it. But I also understood the amount of time it was taken away from me, taken away from my family. It was I had a brand new baby. At the time. You know you can blow the dust off him. Just brand new. Do I want to keep taking time from him? 
That was that was that was my thing. And I chose, I said, you know what? They're not worth the shot. I took a shot at them. I'm not gonna keep digging. So I refocused towards the other fish, the ones that I could readily identify. Those are the ones I took action against. But it's one of the things when I talked about, these are the things that they're speaking of. Securing or hiding, concealing, whatever you want to use, their identities as a means of not being drawn into something, even if they know it's illegal or not. They are participants. Because those drivers that transferred me were participants in the actions of someone else. They're just pawns. And that's all. They're pawns in someone else's actions. Do I still want to keep getting these pawns? Well, I took it to note, they were no longer a danger to me. Let me go after the king. And these, these are some of the things that I took. Those are, now, could I, could I have kept them? Absolutely. But again, it's, what do I want? What do I want? Because in the, in the long run, when I took a shot at the king, I didn't miss. I took a took a um, took a page from Machiavelli and the Prince. I went after my enemy and I destroyed him wholly. But at the end of the day, it was the refocusing that allowed me to destroy my enemy wholly, because I had to understand who it is that I wanted and what I wanted. Sometimes we have to allow certain transgressions to go unscathed to go after bigger fish. When you're speaking with me and you're asking me for the, the most advantageous route of doing something, I'm going to give you directions until I see there needs to be a change in strategy. Because the absolute goal should never change. But and the road to get there might. And that's one of the things I talk, I talk about when we're talking about you're contacting me for help. You got to be willing to fight because I'm willing to fight with you, not for you. But anyway, now for an example, Bell v. City of Milwaukee. The plaintiff succeeded in their access to court conspiracy claim after police officers shot the victim, placed a knife in his hand, falsified the police reports to indicate that he was the attacker and originally settled with the, the family for relatively little. This is also something that I, I constantly harp on people to, one, to stop doing. Stop calling police officers when you have a family member that is having a mental health episode. But here's the, here's the flip side to that. If you call the hospital, they're going to tell you to call the police. Now, I talk about, and I've shown example after example after example, of... We're creating cowards or we're creating killers. A majority of the people that are being killed by police officers, a, a large majority, are people that are going through mental health episodes. Majority of the people that are being um, having excessive force used against them are people that are going through mental health episodes. So we're sending attack dogs to a situation where all they see is attack. While they're trained in de-escalation situations, 99.9% .9 of them don't use the training except to escalate. Because if you're trained in de-escalation, guess what you are very well versed in? Escalation. So understand that. So when you're bringing this in, the reason why I, I stopped there is because when you're talking about this, the you know the police officers 
access to court conspiracy. They placed, they shot the victim, placed a knife in his hand, and falsified police reports. That is something that was done in Arizona. And this literally, I believe I did a um, podcast on this, I want to say two years ago. It was one of my first podcasts. I talked about the Arizona police officer that had been involved in multiple shootings. Both of them were um, shootings of mental health people going through a crisis. And one where he shot, uh, um, I believe it was a transgender woman, and then placed a knife on her chest and wrote in his police report that um, she had attacked him. But he forgot that his body camera was running the entire time and... You know, they end up settling with the family. The thing is, he's still a police officer. Because no one ever challenges any arrest that he makes. Even though he's lied in a police report, which is a sworn document, which the prosecutor uses to prosecute. See how that cycle keeps going on? Do you see now how the Tommy Sotomayor question is more relevant? Because the constitutional right to access to court is lost where... In Bale's case, the police officers shielded from the plaintiff key facts which would have formed the basis of the claims of redress. Say that one more time. By lying in the police officer's report, the constitutional right to access the court is lost because the police officer shielded from the plaintiff's key facts which would have formed the basis for the claims for redress. This is why these police reports are so important. This is why these warrant applications are so important. Because these are things that show claims for redress. These are things that show that the plaintiff has the ability to access, excuse me, access the court. Because plaintiffs can prove conspiracy by using circumstantial evidence. Because we've heard that before. Conspiracy of silence context to conceal the identity of the officers. This is also one of the reasons or one of the strategies of the state because police officers and their reports initiate prosecution because their arrest reports are what the prosecutor used to charge or cherry pick their defendants. The prosecutor is then responsible for evidence even if the police do not turn it over, and yet it is your responsibility to make sure it is requested properly. But understanding, dismissing conspiracy claim against police officers who have allegedly falsified a police report and destroy evidence because allegations of the act done in the furtherance of the goals of the conspiracy are insufficient. Without facts from which one can infer that a conspiracy made an agreement, Conspirators made an agreement. The circumstantial evidence would be you're requesting a detailed discovery. It's not being turned over. Or whenever you are you get the police report, you don't get supporting evidence to prove what's being said. But you have requested body cam footage. You have requested any other audio that supports what the police officer is saying. You know, the jiggly information. Because now you have things such as disciplinary actions that you can bring in. There are a litany of things that can be done and be addressed when you're dealing with this. But understand, it is your responsibility to do so. Because explaining that the Code of Silent turns 1983 suits into credibility contests, making it harder for plaintiffs to succeed. But whose credibility are we not challenging? We're not challenging the police officer's credibility. Why? Because when we started this situation, we haven't requested a detailed discovery. We haven't laid the foundation. And if we never challenge it, or if we don't challenge it in the beginning, we can never challenge it. And then if we're allowing the credibility to go unscathed, it remains as such. Say that one more time. If we allow the credibility to go unscathed, which initiated all of this, 
It will remain as such. And you will lose your case. Because if you're able to demonstrate that the officers had formed an agreement, you still may not have stated a claim because not all conspiratory acts involved in a cover-up are actionable under 1983. I'm going to say that one more time. Even if you're able to demonstrate that there is a conspiracy, you may not have stated a claim because all conspiratory acts involved in a cover-up are not actionable under 1983. I actually wanted that to sink in a little bit. Because when we're talking about this case, Sanders v. City of Indianapolis, Sanders claimed that the police officers used excessive force when arresting him, then formed a conspiracy to conceal their identities of the officers that were involved in the beating and therefore his access to the courts. Here's what Sanders did not have initially. He didn't request Jiglio information on the officers that he did have that gave him the citation. Basically, he did not present evidence such as non-responsive affidavits, interrogatories, or depositions. He did not go into the context of pointing the fingers at individual officers and pointing to individual actions from these individual officers. Basically, he didn't show evidence that the defendants fabricated or concealed relevant facts. Why? Because you do that through a detailed discovery. You have the right to the information that the police are supposed to submit and file. You know, like, you have the right to body camera footage. You have the right to calls. You have the right to certain vehicle locations for certain actions. You have the right to a scene report. You have the right to the 911 call that, or the call to service, as they call it. You even have the right to subpoena those if you have first requested them and they have been denied. Or, in a lot of cases, ignored. So basically, a police officer conspired to commit perjury for which there is no liability in 1983. Remember I told you, when you set up one with the 1983, there's another shoe that falls. You have to word it properly for it to actually go down to the taking of the access to court. Because whenever you're doing one, you have to have them all. Because even if the officers conceal their identity, right? There's still a scene report. Officers falsify evidence or refuse to comply with discovery. These are things that are normal. Those are commonplace. These are where you kick in. These are the places where you actually go out and say, you know what? I have to challenge this. Because Stone v. City of Chicago, 1984, upholding a successful access to court's conspiracy claim when police falsified multiple police reports, failed to report a hit and run, and did not interview bystanders who have witnessed excessive use of force. Because even in this, not every act of deception in connection with the judicial procedure gives rise to an action. Because, again, police are allowed to lie. But what police are not allowed to do is not perform the totality of circumstances. I'm going to say that police are required to perform the totality of circumstances. They can't go off everything just he said, she said. They have to actually have reasonable doubt, reasonable suspicion, reasonable Articulable. See, that's that's the heavy word. Articulable. They have to actually make 
because when you're talking about reasonable, we all we gotta remember we're going we're on the low end of the spectrum. When we're talking about reasonable, we're talking about low end of the spectrum. We're talking about 107 and less on the IQ scale. So what's reasonable to them might not be reasonable to somebody with an IQ of 112. Just understand that because the world is different above 107. The view is different above 107. That's why we look at certain people with high IQ, high functioning um, people with IQ like 140, 150, whatever. And they like they don't know how to socialize. They are they are introvert. They're, they're all these other things. They're weird to us. Because the world is different when that IQ is different. So you have to understand when, when you're down at 107 and below, the world is different. So their idea of reasonable is different. But that does not circumvent their actions or responsibilities in law. These are the things that a lot of people hate with me. Because one of the things I do is make sure you understand this is why you learn the language of the court. And this is why you understand what is needed to be successful in it. But the biggest understanding that most people get upset with me about is the responsibility one has to themselves. Because even if you hire a lawyer, that lawyer is your employee. It is your responsibility to make sure everything that is done is done to your satisfaction. You are the boss. You need to behave as one. It's your life. Why would you leave it to someone else to fight for? 